Okay, so my whole life, I have been a Bible guy about, you know, my Christian life. Uh, and any time a tradition is brought up, or even the thought of church tradition, I've seen it as an attack on the authority of Scripture. Um, I, I look at church tradition, I have looked at church tradition as just, I don't, I don't get that. Now, I will say my views are starting to change a little bit. I, I'm starting to go, oh, okay, maybe it's not as blasphemous as I thought it, it, it was. Um, I, I would love to hear from you guys. For all the people that are in the same boat I was just a few months ago, just looking at everything that I cannot read in the Bible specifically as somewhat heretical, what would you say to that? First of all, any tradition that contradict the scripture or devalue the scripture, I think um, we should be careful not to jump into that and embrace it. Mm. Uh, it is like a bird has two wings. You clip one wing off, it will not make it. Um, so the the... the the scripture didn't create the church. The church created the scripture. And the apostles' uh, doctrines and apostle traditions. That's where Paul said to Thessalonians, if people don't follow the traditions we have handed down to you, do not have anything to do with them. And he said that elsewhere in Corinthians chapter 11. Um, with all the stupidity of the church, he said, one thing I tell you good about, you people have followed the traditions that we have handed down to you, even with the mistakes they had. So there is a human tradition that uh, people create themselves for themselves, but then there is a holy tradition which enhances us to follow the Lord. Um, and so not understand that difference is a big problem. Um, uh, like a train, um, it need two tracks to run on. So the holy traditions are things handed down. You know, it's like, look at the American flag. Look at the American anthem. After 2,000 years, if there is time, no one is going to change the flag or the anthem. And they keep doing that. And um, shake a hand or uh, bowing. Uh, these are all... Um, you know, traditions that are handed down to us. When I was a small boy, eating with a hand, not fork and knife. But in regards to following God, for us to understand the ways of God, kneeling in prayer, raising hands, or um, incense uh, in the in the worship or how they conduct the Holy Communion, uh, the liturgical service. Uh, these are all uh, um, traditions uh, that are enhancing and helping people. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, sacrament life is one thing that it's one of the things we do constantly to teach people to embrace sacramental life. What does that mean? Sacraments are means for us to experience God's grace. Like before I go take a shower, for example, this is one of the tr traditions that is, the, um, I, I, I stop for a second and say, I just can't believe God, this water, this place, mm -hmm. you created this. Mm -hmm. And I make the sign of the cross, which simply saying, God from heaven came down from heaven to earth, died on the cross to take me from the left, put me on the right, my body, my soul, my spirit belong to him. That's a tradition. Mm -hmm. But it helps me to think about him before mm -hmm. I eat meal or after the meal is mm -hmm. over or uh, you know, there's a million things. Oh, 24 hours, our life is actually becomes sacramental. It is nothing physical, nothing visible is unspiritual. Mm -hmm. They are means for us to look through, as C.S. Lewis said, mm -hmm. and see God. So rightly understanding the tradition, that's the reason why the ancient mm -hmm. church, the pattern of worship and the icons or a lot of things that are helping us to understand mm -hmm. um, the, the way we should worship God. And in the Old Testament, you'll find God told the people a thousand things they should do. They perpetuated the thing. Mm -hmm. The holy traditions are non-negotiable. It's like the other mm -hmm. wing of the word. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, we need both. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Some people say we only need the scripture, uh, but um, they don't understand. A um, lot of times it is not explained how to do things and what mm-hmm. to do. So how to do things, what to do is given to us by the apostles and early fathers. Okay, so so you're distinguishing. There's some traditions that are just great. They help us, you know, believers have used them for all time. But then there's other ones that are holy traditions that you're saying this is this is what Paul is referring to, you know, in Second Thessalonians. Those the, There are traditions that were written, and then there were others that were spoken. He's explicitly in Scripture. How do we know, uh, like where would a common person like me, where would I find out what are those holy traditions? Um, Where would you turn me to? Yeah, well, first of all, I'd um, I'd, uh, agree with uh, what uh, Metropolitan Yohanan has just uh, communicated, and I think very, very well. But what I would add to that is that tradition is also Scripture rightly understood. Mm -hmm. Uh, Meaning that the early church did not have the Scriptures, but they had word of mouth that was Mm -hmm. being communicated from one uh, Mm -hmm. believer to another. It, it, It wasn't just... Uh, the Holy Fathers or the Apostolic Fathers, but it was the grandmas in the churches Mm -hmm. who are passing it on to their children and their grandchildren. Uh, So so these are, 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 are teachings of the church that are being communicated by one generation to another generation to another generation. Uh, if you only miss one generation, uh, you, 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 you lose that whole tapestry. You know, if we fail to communicate the truths that we have been entrusted with, we fail to communicate them to our children, to your children, to my children, to your children. If we fail to do that, the whole glossomer strand of civilization becomes lost. That's why it's so important that we hand down the faith once for all, delivered to the saints, to our own children and they to theirs. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we lose the faith and that is happening even now. So, uh, but, but, but now there is a time in which the letters that are circulated in the church are formally codified in scripture in 367 by Athanasius. And uh, then they become widely circulated in the churches in the, in the latter part of the 4th century, in the 5th century, in the 6th century, and so forth. But in addition to that, you have, you have the traditions that are passed on that can become traditionalism. Uh, you're a, you're a Slav Pelican, uh, a great uh, Orthodox scholar from Yale University, I believe it is. Uh, he said that tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. Let that percolate in your mind for a moment. You know, we are, as it were, dancing on the ashes of the saints who are not living vitally in their reality. Why? Because we don't know it. So the thing that I'm adding to this with respect to tradition is the tradition is the Bible rightly understood because not only was the Bible given to us through the church, as uh, KP rightly said, but a proper understanding of the Bible is given. Uh, through the church, and that is holy tradition. It is a proper understanding, a proper reading of the Bible, which of course is logically communicated by those who are closest to the apostles geographically and speaking the same language. Now, you see, the, the, all churches have traditions. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, Bible mm-hmm. churches or any any church, they all have printed uh, the, 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 the way they conduct their service. Yeah. So many songs, so many prayer, then preaching, then this and that. All the, that's, they, they never change that. For all people all over, it's the same thing. But what we are concerned about is the holy traditions yeah, that's right. that was from the beginning handed down mm-hmm. that, like 
the, the, the sensing, what does that mean? That's a holy tradition. And uh, the women covering their head in the worship, the baptism, how it is done, and the uh, holy company, how it is done, the marriage, how it is done. Mm -hmm. So there's a mm -hmm. lot of things. So when you say Orthodox Church or the ancient church, um, unless we get into the details of what they do, yeah. um, uh, we, we miss the intricacies of how they do these things. In here in the Western theology, especially in America, I mean, it's independent. You do what you feel like doing, yeah. you know, that kind of... I, I, I think that yeah. takes away from uh, the, our willingness to be part of a church yeah. together, yeah. worship. The liturgical service is so sacred yeah. because it is not individual worshiping. It is the people of God together worshiping and angels and archangels and... and we can see them, but they are present mm -hmm. uh, in yeah. this. They, it, it's 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 a it's a amazing mystery when enter into a worship where we embrace the word and also the traditions. Well, I think there's a lot of us that have not thought that through for one, and and we just thought it was uh, the righteous thing to do is to study the scriptures and figure out what would be most biblical. I mean, that's what I've been doing um, now. But now I hear this and I go, okay, this makes some sense. But honestly, I, I just think maybe I'm looking for cliff notes or something. I'm saying, okay, what are those holy traditions? Again, where would I find it? Is there one book with proof that tells me, look, they did this. Like if you lived in the first, second, third century AD, here's what your worship experience would have been like universally. Um, is there some place to look and not, get that? Not necessarily, but what, what okay. you know, when you're talking about sensing, as KP rightly said, um, this goes back mm -hmm. to perpetuating what happened in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. uh, what happened in uh, the early church. This is something that's passed on, and and so it's not innovative. Mm -hmm. When you talk about Human traditions. I mean, it's easy to look at the at the ancient church and saying, "Oh, that tradition is bad." But look at the traditions that have cropped up in the modern church. All kinds of traditions, and KP alluded to some of those traditions. Think about the fact that in the 19th century, you have a man who comes up with a new tradition that is now the most popular tradition in modern evangelicalism, John Nelson Darby. Just as Darwin put a speculative spin on the quote-unquote scientific truths that he discovered, um, and he was an innovator, so you have John Nelson Darby putting a speculative spin on the scriptures. So he looks at the scriptures now and he says, and he was part of the Plymouth Brethren, and he says, um, you know what, I think God has two distinct people with two distinct plans necessitating two distinct phases of the second coming. A secret coming, seven years later, a second coming. Well, that became a whole new way of reading the scripture because rightly dividing the word of truth now became trying to understand which of the scriptures apply to Israel and which of the scriptures apply to the church. That's a brand new tradition. The Apostle Paul, if you go back and say, what is authentic tradition as opposed to human tradition? Well, you go back to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul never communicates that God has two distinct people already. He is communicating that God has always had one covenant community beautifully connected by a cross and illustrated by the Apostle Paul as a cultivated olive tree that has branches, some grafted in and some cut off, but one cultivated olive tree. So God doesn't have two people, he's got one covenant community. I, I guess last thing I wanna ask is, uh, you know, I think about when Christ would look at the the Pharisees, and he says, you know, you're tithing mint and coming, but you're, way, you're neglecting the weightier provisions of the law. And this is, again, from like an outside perspective. Sometimes I'll look at 
a church that's uh, more sacramental and go, it seems like you guys are caring a lot about how you burn this incense and what you do with this cross. And, and yet the people I'm meeting coming out of these churches, a lot of times I don't see this vibrant love for Christ and love for each other, passion for evangelism. And it seems like maybe a, a improper weightiness, you know, would it, would it be? You know, just this is again, my perception. And like, is there within, you know, your church this idea of like, here are the more important things. Um, you know, are there the more weighty? Because from, from my study of scripture, like when I look at scripture, I go, what did Christ emphasize most? I want to emphasize those things. What those New Testament authors emphasize the most? I want to emphasize those things. And again, this is one person's experience when I look at people that come from maybe Anglican, Catholic, Eastern Orthodox. Uh, my gut sense or read, I don't know what the word is, is sometimes, wow, you guys care very much about this dress and this and this. And I'm not saying they're not important, but it seems like there's a neglect maybe of the waiter thing. What, is that no, I think inaccurate? No, I think it's, it's, it's right. I mean, it's what I was trying to communicate when I was trying to communicate the difference between tradition and traditionalism. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that you can, uh, again, tradition being the living faith of the dead and traditionalism being the dead faith of the living, mm -hmm. you know, where, where we're no longer enveloped in the treasure chest uh, and we're, 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 we're doing things just in rote as opposed to in reality. Mm -hmm. um, but think about some of these traditions that are so critical. They're like three braided cords that are woven together that so much of the church today has neglected, in fact, relegated, oh, that's just tradition. Mm -hmm. Think about fasting. How significant is fasting? Jesus didn't say, if you fast. He says, so when you fast. And he says, oh, by the way, when you fast, don't disfigure your faces to show men you are fasting. Then you have your reward already. Instead, wash your head, put oil on your head, and, and, and don't make it obvious that people, uh, to people that you're fasting, then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you opening. So this is a, a, a tradition that is passed down from one generation to another. It is part of the liturgical calendar. It has mm -hmm. been in the church in time memoriam. We don't practice that. Prayer, proper prayer, as, as, um, as Metropolitan Yohanan has, has properly said. I mean, uh, whether you use a prayer rope or not, uh, I find this is to be extraordinarily helpful as well. But the, prayer, the Jesus prayer, you know, the, the, the prayer of Jesus, as I call it, in a best-selling book I wrote called The Prayer of Jesus, but there's also the Jesus prayer that keeps you constant in prayer, which is the very thing that Paul prays for uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, in the, in, in the uh, chapter on the full armor of God. Uh, so uh, it's one of the ways in which you can calm your your anxious mind and, and do the very thing that, um, that uh, KP so properly and beautifully said. I mean, we focus on the fact, Lord Jesus Christ, on the grandeur of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And so we, we see ourselves as helpless, uh, unworthy sinners in need of the greatness of our Savior. To pray that over and over again was a tradition that is passed down in the church and has been very, very helpful in keeping us constant in prayer. Um, you know, obviously reading the Bible is a tradition. What about almsgiving? This is what uh, a Gospel for Asia has done so beautifully all over the world. They've given alms. When you fast, you, 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 you withdraw from food to feast on God. You fast from food, you feast on God. Well, there's money left over. What do you do with that money that you didn't spend on the food? You give alms to the poor. So it starts building a habit within you of giving. Uh, and 
Those are traditions that all have a root in Scripture. They're grounded in principles of Scripture. So perhaps you cannot trace the origin directly by connecting the dots from A to B to C to D and so forth, but these are traditions in the church that have withstood the test of time, and they're all traditions that ultimately have validation in the Scripture. And, you know, the, another thing is the confession that is, is, it's so sad. The, the Western Church replaced the confession with the counseling sessions uh, where people go and talk to a pastor mm -hmm. with these problems. Mm -hmm. But the biblical thing from the beginning was um, in, in, in the worship, um, you know, there's always people had time to go to the um, uh, priest um, and, and have this private confession and um, hear the words from him, your sins are forgiven as you have asked the Lord to do so. And th th those, those kind of practices are very, very helpful to keep the body yes. united yeah. and uh, yeah. feeling, you know, um, I'm weak, but I'm loved by the church. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Church never forgets um, um, anyone, you know, whether they're living or dead. Mm -hmm. um, so in the early church, you know, they, they never used the word frequently, somebody died. They used the word departed. Mm -hmm. They are departed, um, but they are alive. Mm -hmm. And they are a cloud of witnesses with us. Mm -hmm. And so, they, friends, there's a sense of the church really in a in an alien land, but belong to the Lord, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> everybody um, uh, shared together in worship and everything we do. And I tell you, many of the, I priests not too long ago met a Catholic cardinal, and he looked a little gloomy and sad. I said, um, um, "What happened to you?" And I know him. He said, "Oh, nothing." Um, so I said, "No, you you look kind of a little sad." He said, "Well." tell you I was 40 days fasting and praying. I said, some problem? He said, no, every year I do that just to get to know the Lord. Mm. That's a tradition he developed mm -hmm. um, of spending that, you know, mm -hmm. year, the time. And of course, you know, we have, our church, um, every year is, every day is packed with something going on, celebration, uh, or we just had the three days of Nineveh, you know, the fasting and prayer. Um, applying, mm -hmm. you know, God made the decision to destroy the Nineveh, but they cried out to God, and their God could see the visibly their repentance, mm -hmm. and God forgave mm -hmm. them. And mm -hmm. it's invitation for uh, people to take those three days mm -hmm. of Lent. Um, uh, you know, the Lent season is coming up. All our churches uh, mm -hmm. militantly follow the Lent season. Mm -hmm. In this is forty days of fasting. You know. Uh, one meal or two meal and mm -hmm. praying much mm -hmm. and then going out in the community and sharing with the poor and needy and helping yes, and all yeah. that. So those, these, kind of, these are uh, things that will help our uh, people to learn more about. Well, and I think that's what some of this comes down to, even in my thinking, and I don't want to be too pragmatic over it all, but I, I look at the condition of the church right now and I, I remember one time when you drove me to a speaking event and there's smoke and lights and, you know, okay, this band. And, and you made the comment, you go, you just kind of chuckled and says, you Americans are funny. You know, no one will show up unless there's a great speaker. Uh, no one will come unless there's a great band. And you said, you know, in India, when they hear there's a prayer gathering, oh, people get excited just to pray. And then you talked about when uh, that people would get excited to celebrate communion and they would flock just to celebrate communion. And that was so convicting to me because I thought, no one does that here. But I thought, and again, this is just from my pragmatic mind. I'm thinking, you know, from God's point of view, looking down and seeing these people in India flocking, looking forward to take of the body and blood of Christ. Meanwhile, here, this flocking, depending on the speaker and the band and just going, ah, oh, there was a, there was a, just a very unsettled feeling in me going, gosh, we're going further and further in this direction. 
to where we're canceling prayer meetings because who even wants to come to those anymore? Or, or let's make them more exciting. Or let's figure out a way to get communion more exciting and, and seeing a rightness of people gathering for the sake of, you know, devoting themselves to the body and blood and going, I, I want to see that change. And, uh, and, and yet in all our efforts to be more creative, to attract people to the church, we've tried to use other means than some of the things we spir- you know, see spelled out in scripture. And what I'm hearing from you both is there are also these traditions that were passed down and the idea of them were, it was to preserve and to keep us pointing to Christ and his incarnation and his resurrection rather than um, getting caught up in some of these other other uh, things that could attract you to gatherings. So I, I just... The sacramental life is a life of worshiping God and I think that's what you're driving mm-hmm. at. And, and uh, that's, that's the thing that I always experience when I open the door uh, on Sunday to the church. In my mind, I'm not going for a great sermon. I'm not going for a musical extravaganza. I'm going to worship God. And the sacramental life allows me to worship God. There are sacraments for a reason. Uh, The church has always embraced the sacrament of confession. I think you alluded to that. The sacrament of confession is not, it's been prostituted and added to in many ways. So now you're you know, you have a little booth and you, uh, the curtains open and there's a priest in there, there's a priest that you confess to. And well, true sacrament of confession was never confession to a priest. The priest was the witness of your confession mm-hmm. to God and became the counselor for you. But that became a way of confessing your sins, knowing he's faithful and just will forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Sacrament of confession was something I knew nothing about until Uh I went back and studied the ancient church and realized, wow, this is what you do in the ancient church. Even at the beginning of my journey towards examining orthodoxy, I had no idea of going in and confessing my sins. And boy, I'll tell you what, there are a couple of things that are just so beautiful about it. Number one, I recognize when I confess my sins, it makes me very vulnerable and I want to make sure that I'm living a righteous life before God, you know, where no one else can see what I'm doing, but living a a righteous life before God because I'm confessing that with a witness, the priest who is on earth. And and, uh, so, but I'll tell you the first time I went to and experienced the sacrament of confession, I felt like I had been born again Uh, not born again in the born again sense, but born again as a new baby, just birthed out of my mother's mother's womb. I I felt cleansed because I I confessed my sin in the sacrament of confession. And I do that individually, but this is also something that is done within uh, uh, w- within the context of the body of Christ. I'm not a Lone Ranger Christian. You know, I think I told you, I, I, I know I t- told uh, KP this, that I, I remember sitting around with a bunch of Christian leaders who are friends of mine and are ho- household words in the Christian world. I would never divulge their names, but they and I were communicating this many, many years back. You know, do you go to church? <laughs> no, I don't go to church anymore. Do you go to church? No, I don't go to church. I don't like to go to church anymore either. Why? Well, because, you know, we've sort of been lifted out of that. Mm. Well, today I can't imagine ever having thought that. Mm. I am absolutely, I can't wait to get to the church to partake of the body of blood of Christ, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. I can't wait to avail myself for the sacrament of confession mm. uh, throughout the year. I, the sacraments are Part of the tradition of the church. Now, there isn't necessarily a guidebook for it, but there are markers along the way. And I alluded to the Didache, you know, which is a, which is a, uh, which which is a book that is written that 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 you can access and, and you kind of see, okay, what was the church doing? Uh, 
sort of a catechism for the church. You know, what was the church doing at the end of the first century? Well, go read the Didache. Mm. You know, it, 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 it dates back to the first century to the early embryonic church. Mm. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel over and over again, and we don't have to raise in our own churches new traditions, which are the true. KP is absolutely right. I mean, you know, people talk about tradition in a negative sense, but every church has their own mm. traditions, and many of them make some of these traditions, as I was alluding to earlier, acid tests for orthodoxy when mm. they're not acid tests for orthodoxy at all. Mm. No, I appreciate it. I mean, I, I, I think my hope in this discussion was you know, and with others listening in, obviously, was not necessarily to convince everyone uh, these are the holy traditions, everything else, but uh, hopefully to shed light on here's two men that are pursuing their faith in Three. Christ. Well, yeah, I'm, but I'm pointing to you, obviously, um, that are pursuing Christ in this way. Not, not to say everyone has to do it just this way, but to, I look at that and I go, I don't see why I would disassociate with you. That doesn't make sense to me biblically. Whether I completely buy into which traditions are holy, which traditions are not, or even if I say, I don't believe in tradition, um, I would still go, gosh, but their faith in Christ, uh, the, the non-negotiables that we talk about, those foundational things are still there. I guess I'm just saying, um, we're so quick nowadays to point one thing out and say, okay, everybody disassociate with him or him because he does this. And as I listen to the way you explain, even confession just now, okay, that's interesting. I'll need to research that a little bit more. Um, that does sound refreshing. It does sound like a great tradition. Um, it's a sacrament. Yeah, sacrament. Okay, and again, I'm learning all this myself. I guess my point is I just, I still have a lot of learning to do. I believe a lot of people do. Um, it's just how we do it uh, in that spirit of love. Not saying we just embrace everything, but what is within that realm of orthodoxy and how can we have um, loving and helpful discussions on this and humble discussions yes. about this and so and thanks for your time I know you're both extremely old so there's not that much time and so you giving that to me is great so thank you Francis yeah. it's a blessing yeah. thank you. it's always great to be with you yeah. yeah it's great to have this discussion